All right, I've started the record, David. Good morning, Gilda from the Philippines. Thanks for joining us this morning and thanks for saying hello on the chat. I'm gonna wait one more minute and then we'll start officially. I'd certainly encourage all of you to uh, bring greetings on the chat function and say hello, Rosa. Great to see you. Or great to see your name <laughs> on the chat function. Claire is joining us from Paris. Great to see you too. Joe from Ireland this is fantastic. Well, let's get started. Uh, this is a real uh, treat for me personally to be with so many of my friends and colleagues and to be uh, chatting with you today on this International Day uh, for Persons with Disability. Let's remember that disability rights are human rights. Um, diversity is always a strength um, and inclusion matters. And those are the things that we're going to be uh, speaking about today and sharing with you and engaging in a conversation. And thank you. Uh, thank you for those who are attending as guests. Thank you to my friends and colleagues for participating with me today and joining this session as part of the 13th session of the Conference of State Parties uh, to the CRPD. This is again a momentous occasion. The overarching theme for this year's uh, seminar is a decade of action and delivery for inclusive, sustainable development, implementing the CRPD in the 2030 agenda for all persons with disabilities. And this particular session, we're gonna focus on the sub-theme of promoting inclusive environments for the full implementation of the CRPD. My name is David Legg, and I'm the president of IFAPA, which is the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity, which is the host organizing, host, host organizer, or the host association organizing, excuse me, today's session. Uh, IFAPA started in 1973, uh, and I am only just the current president in a long list of people that have served this association and have certainly provided tremendous and outstanding leadership. Another example would be Dr. Martin Block, who's one of our panelists today, who was the president before me, and one of the attendees I saw just on the chat function, uh, Claire from Paris, is another past president that's with us here today. So certainly a long and illustrious list of great leaders in adapted physical activity. Um, the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity, again, has, has been around since the, the early 1970s. And really, we have kind of three, uh, three main areas of focus. Number one is to encourage international cooperation in the field of adapted physical activity to the benefit of individuals of all abilities. And so hosting an event like this is certainly an example of that. Number two is to promote and stimulate and support research in the field of adapted physical activity throughout the world. And, I hope that you enjoy hearing some of the examples that my colleagues from across the globe present to us today of exemplars and benchmarks of some of the great research and projects that are taking place. And number three is to make scientific knowledge of and practical experiences in adapted physical activity available to all interested persons, organizations, and institutions. And so we are not simply a think tank, we are, we are practitioners as well. Our goals and our hopes is to ensure that the things that we talk about and think about are acted upon and benefit persons with a disability in a grassroots level. And I would argue that this is particularly timely, a timely conversation as it relates to the pandemic. Uh, persons with a disability are, are even more impacted in their opportunities and abilities to participate in sport, physical activity, physical education, recreation, and leisure than ever before. And so I, I think this conversation is in particular uh, a timely one uh, for us to have. With that, it's now my great pleasure to turn it over to my colleague and the co-host of today's session, the, the co-moderator, uh, Mr. Eli Wolf. Uh, Eli is going to introduce himself very quickly, talk about some of the management of today's session, and then, in, and then queue up and introduce our first speaker who will be by video. Eli, over to you. Excellent, well, welcome everybody. Thank you all for joining us from around the world. 
on this uh, really important day and important uh, occasion um, part of the conference's three parties in this context in the virtual world. Um, this is a really important conversation we're having today. Um, I've worked um, around disability in sport and sport for development and power of sport for over the last 20 years. Um, was part of the drafting of Article 30 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And I've also been quite involved um, with efforts around the International Day of Sport for Development and Peace, which is on April 6th. And so many of the colleagues here and, and many that are joining us today, it's, it's wonderful to see all of you um, and to continue to the collaboration and working to continue to build um, policy, practice, action, research um, toward um, the inclusion and the rights and dignity of persons with disabilities. Um, for today, we're going to be um, using the Q&A uh, for the question. So you'll see in the Zoom, you have the Q&A. So we're really gonna encourage you um, to share your questions and comments. We'll be addressing those at the end. In the last 15 to 20 minutes, we'll be addressing any questions that come in. Um, but we do wanna also encourage the, the chat box that we have here for sharing just informally, um, kind of sharing where you're from and, and making comments and reflections. But for formal uh, questions and uh, comments, we would like you to all use the Q&A function in, in the Zoom. Um, we also have uh, the closed captioning uh, service that's through Otter um, captioning. And so there is a link, you can access it right onto Zoom and in the closed captioning. Um, and so feel free to, if you need to use that, um, please do. So at this time, we're going we, to open up. Um, we, I know we have Catherine Cardi's remarks, um, but before we get to Catherine's, we have a, a really wonderful, we're very honored um, that ha we've had Daniela Bass, the director from UNDESA um, and the Department um, for Social Inclusion and Social Development uh, to provide a statement, um, just to kind of open us, and then we'll have uh, Catherine. Um, so give me a moment and I will to now share this wonderful comment. It's about five minutes long. Ladies and gentlemen and experts, in my role as a director of the United Nations Division on Inclusive Social Development of the Department of the Economic and Social Affairs, I'm really honored to celebrate together the 3rd December, which is the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. The division I lead is responsible for data for the whole United Nations system in providing thought leadership and sound policy advice to governments and other stakeholders such as, <laughs> such as the private sector, academia, individuals, NGOs, and so on, on promoting the well-being of vulnerable groups of people and the social dimension of sustainable development. And since 2017, uh, we also have the substantive portfolio on sport for development and peace. And today, together, let's reimagine how to strengthen cooperation with the United Nations and other stakeholders on sport for and with persons with disabilities in order to leave no one behind as the 2030 Agenda asks us to do, as well as the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. You see, more and more people, either because of aging, natural disasters, or man-made disasters like wars and violence, besides the medical reasons, acquire disabilities. They can be physical, sensory, mental, behavioral, invisible ones. We are talking about well above, therefore, one billion people in the world with some form of disability. And also the present COVID-19 pandemic is causing in many who suffered and recovered from this virus, various forms of disabling conditions, either temporarily or permanently. The focus today is about inclusive environments. Well, what are? inclusive environments. Sharing physical space is not enough, since real inclusion happens when uh, there is a sense of belonging, of being part of, when people create meaningful relationships 
and people with and without disabilities experience the full uh, participation uh, on an equal basis in all dimensions of life. Inclusion means places that work better for everybody, be that the environments are schools, offices, streets, care homes, parks, means of transportation, recreational, or spaces where to practice physical activities, dance, and the sport in general. Indeed, the global outbreak of COVID-19 has resulted in closure of gyms, study, schools, dance, and fitness studios, physiotherapy centers, parks, and playgrounds, and many individuals are therefore not able to actively participate in their regular individual or group sporting or physical activities outside their homes. This physical distancing impacts even more persons with disabilities and their ability to participate in sport and physical activities to keep strong and healthy. And what about athletes with the disabilities and their training? to participate to the many sport and mega events ahead of us, either as athletes or even as spectators. What are the production and supply on sport related products and services and other industries, such as the media, tourism, transportation, hotel chains, sport equipment, technical devices, etc., etc. Now all of this is part of creating inclusive environments. What are they doing? to reimagine cooperation and build back better during and after COVID-19 to assure that sport and persons with disabilities are fully included and valued and active. With this question, I want to conclude these short opening remarks and contribution to celebrate together the 3rd of December, the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, focusing on sport, dance, physical activities and inclusive environments. I would like to share with you that uh, we in uh, the United Nations, my, the division I lead, is organizing on the 15th of December, most surely it's going to be the 15th of December, um, a, virtual, a virtual sport for development and peace, multi-stakeholder dialogue. And this webinar will focus on sport and technology in the lead up to the Commission for Social Development next February 2021 that has as a theme digital technologies, well-being and social development. And digital technologies and technologies in general are very important as well to promote inclusive environments. So the outcome of today, I hope that somehow will be part of that information that can be shared during the Commission for Social Development next year and can be disseminated through various media to create more awareness and have all stakeholders engaged and really take pragmatic actions to increase cooperation and partnerships on sport and disability related matters to make all environments inclusive. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eli. And thank you to Ms. Bass for recording that presentation for us. It now gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce Catherine Carty, who is the UNESCO Chair at the Institute of Technology in Tralee, Ireland. Uh, this will be the, the compilation of today's session will be a veritable tour of the globe in and of itself. And uh, so I'm speaking to you from uh, Western Canada, right now, uh, just outside of Calgary. Eli is speaking to you today from uh, Boston, United States. Eli is a, uh, a former Paralympic athlete, competed in uh, soccer in 2004. And now we're flying across the Atlantic uh, to Ireland, where Catherine's going to bring greetings uh, from her UNESCO position. Catherine, over to you. Hi, everybody, and thank you, David, for the introduction. Thank you, Eli, and thank you indeed for inviting me to the panel today. Um, I'm just to, going to make some opening remarks on how critical it is in the context of global policy to have professionals and programs in APA that will support the delivery of any uh, international and, and global policy objectives. 
it is not possible to deliver on that without having professionals such as those we'll hear from today. So first I'm going to take a very quick run through the policy context in which we're, a lot of the initiatives around sport and inclusion and indeed the implementation of human rights are developing and advancing at the moment. So just quickly introducing the SDGs, and I don't know, Eli, they seem to be a bit distorted on the screen. I'm not sure if there, anything can be done around that. And Looks they're advancing good. on their own. Um, good. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, so one of the key objectives of the Sustainable Development Goals is to ensure that we leave no one behind. Apologies, Eli, can I just check? I'm not sure these slides are moving on their own. <laughs> it's... Um, do you want, would you like me to do it for it? I can. Uh, if, if you, when if we can start from here, but I can't see actually the slide. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so looking at the uh, transforming our world agenda, and we've just flicked on again. Um, it's very sport. Sport appears as Article Thirty Seven or Paragraph Thirty Seven of the Transforming Our World document, and this is the first time in an international policy document like this that sport has been uh, recognised for its contribution to development and and key global development goals. So it's a very significant moment in two thousand and fifteen that we saw sport join that um, kind of or gain that position in international uh, development agendas that that all countries well 195 countries of the world have signed up to and that were agreed over a two-year period in terms of the the priorities that are therein so th this slide is uh, which I cannot fully see I have to say but is how is the sports sector responded to that well, it's true that the sports sector responded very actively to the call made or to that paragraph in um, Transforming Our World Agenda. So here we can see the human rights uh, developments that have happened from 1996. And we kind of know that up to 2006, there was a bit of momentum around human rights as it connects to sport, but not as much as there could be and not as much as there should be. So when the Sustainable Development Goals emerged, it really put an impetus on driving this agenda and that includes driving the Convention on the Rights of, of Persons with Disabilities and seeing what can be done to mobilize actions to realize the human rights that are laid down in the Convention um, and, and uh, explained, or I suppose, uh, aspired to in the Kazan Action Plan, GAPA and other policy instruments. We can move on, Eli, if you want. I think you can. I think you're moving it. I think it's okay. Am I? I can. I cannot actually not see the slides very well. To be honest, they're distorted. Hi. Uh, anyhow, there's an intersection between all these policy agendas. So between the Olympic Charter, the Global Action Plan, the Kazan Action Plan, Sustainable Development Goals, there's a lot of crossover with the objectives here. They're underpinned by a human rights approach and achieving human rights for everyone is going to be very important in realizing the objectives of any of these, any of these policy instruments that we see here. And actually, only this week, on the 1st of December, the UN uh, General Assembly resolution uh, re-emphasized again the importance of sport in the development agenda and in the contribution uh, to human rights and realization of human rights. So the SDGs and human rights are very much uh, connected. And I do think that the, the onset of the Sustainable Development Goals agenda, Goals agenda has given us an impetus to drive practice forward and move practice forward. So a lot of the work that we've been doing in implementing Kazan Action Plan and, and other uh, policy instruments is connected with delivering on the SDGs and the human rights agenda. The ones that remain coloured oh, have disappeared, but effectively there are 10 uh, SDGs that are connected with the Kazan Action Plan delivery and about 39 targets, so quite significant. Those were, momentarily, the six domains that we cover in the Kazan Action Plan indices, and CRPD aligns with all six of these uh, domains. Um, that the indicators for sport and the SDGs connect with. And APA is critical to the delivery across all these six domains. I'm just helping you out, so just... Okay. Yeah, no um, we're aiming to achieve three things, system and population level change, institutional and organizational level change, and community level change through the work we're doing. Again, APA is critical at those all those levels for advocacy, for input, and for delivery of programs. No international instrument makes any sense if it doesn't make sense to making a difference to a person's life on the ground. And that's where the programs come in. We can move on again, Eli? 
So APA is very uh, critical. It's going to look at, uh, there's the definition of APA in the, minute, in the middle, and it's critical to delivery on, on COPD, bridging the policy gap, part of the whole of government approach, linking from the macro change to the micro change, um, and bringing the public and private sector and voluntary sector into delivery and realization of rights. We can move on. Um, we need academia, industry, government, civil society to work together in a creating that contextual environment that will really make that in the, the communities inclusive places for everybody to be able to participate in sport, physical activity and physical education. Um, this is an example, we're creating an example of a model of how to uh, make sport, um, sustainable development goals and human rights understandable at country levels. We recognized um, through the work that we're doing that in many countries, people don't really understand the connection between sport, human rights and sustainable development goals because it's kind of new. So we've developed a methodology for, for socializing this concept at national levels or federal levels. So having dialogues with government stakeholders, having dialogues with the sports sector and having dialogues with right holders to help everybody understand what they can do. But this won't work without capacity building such as the programs that we're going to hear about from our participants in the panel in a second so we can move on and we can move on again just looking at partnerships so partnerships are really important we can move on again Eli thank you so the partnerships are going to be really important to deliver on the global objectives and the objectives in the policy uh, instruments and the policy documents the um, so the goals are underpinned by human rights and we won't achieve them without work, without, uh, without working together. We can move to the final slide, Eli. I was just contextualizing there in that presentation how the global objectives that we see laid down in CRPD, alignment with the SDGs, alignment with, with human rights instrument, um, is really critically important. And to deliver on where the global policy objectives are, we need these programs. And I think now is a really positive time to advance practice forward because we have never seen so much momentum behind the international policy objectives and delivering on them uh, at local levels and in community levels. We need to hear from these programs. So over to your panel, the panel, Eli. Thank you again, David and Eli, and to all the panel. But really excited to hear about the interesting programs that everyone has to deliver on the sustainable development goals and indeed the human rights agenda. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Catherine. Your Agreed. Yes, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your wise words. Uh, and thank you for setting the table um, for the next eight presentations. So again, we've heard from Daniela Baz, we've heard from Catherine Carty as it relates to kind of very high level thinking, the importance of adapted physical activity uh, within the convention as it relates to International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And so we're now gonna, we're gonna fly back from Ireland as if we can still fly. So I, you know, I'm living in a bit of a, you know, a make-believe world perhaps at this moment. We're gonna fly back from Ireland and we're gonna land in Virginia, just south of Washington, DC, where Professor Martin Block from the University of Virginia is gonna be our first speaker. And so we're gonna go through eight different presentations in five minute blocks. And what I would encourage you to do is to post your questions in the Q&A if it's for a specific speaker, and we'll get to these later. Um, when we finished our eight presentations, or if you just want to kind of engage in conversation with your colleagues that are listening in, certainly feel free to use the chat function to introduce yourself. Without further ado, over to the president of IFAP, or prior to my arrival, Dr. Martin Block. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm, I'm very excited to present uh, some information from the U.S. Um, so just kind of, I'm going to be talking about some specific programs uh, where children with and without disabilities are participating in sport together. Just a, a big, a little background here in the U.S., and I think this is kind of unique for us, but at the secondary school level, um, we, yeah, there you go, thank you. At the secondary school level in the United States, we have sports teams where they compete against each other. So one secondary school will play volleyball against another secondary school, and this actually goes up to the state level where there are very intense competitions. Being a member of uh, one of these sports teams is very difficult. Uh, it's very prestigious. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of children don't get a chance to participate, and in particular, children with disabilities rarely get to participate. Again, it's a very competitive competitive environment, and there's tryouts, and if you don't make it, you don't, you don't make it. So many places have decided to create their own sports programs to serve children with disabilities in the school setting. Um, next slide, please. 
So I'm going to highlight um, four states in the U.S. and some kind of unique things that they're doing here. Um, the first one is called Corollary Sports, and this is something you can look at YouTube and find some videos. But this is something they've done in Maryland. And what they've done is they have taken children with and without disabilities who don't participate in this interscholastic sport model, and they create teams for them to participate and compete against themselves and against other schools. Uh, the popular sports include uh, bacha, softball, bowling, and team handball. Um, and again, if you can imagine a group of children with and without disabilities from one secondary school traveling to another secondary school and participating in a softball game against each other. Um, and this may, again, lead to area competitions and state level competitions. So it's a, it's a very unique program that Maryland is doing. It, it's been very effective. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here in Virginia, we have an, a really unique program called the Medford League. So in the United States, um, in Virginia in particular, but all across the United States, we do not have special schools for children with disabilities. If we do, they're very few and far between. In Virginia, I can think of maybe three or four special schools across the whole state. Um, so the more typical model is there'll be a special class of children with disabilities in a regular school. And this allows the children with disabilities to go to regular lunch with their peers, to go to physical education with their peers, et cetera. So in Virginia, um, there was an idea to take these special classes and create a basketball league. So a special class from one secondary school would play uh, basketball against another secondary school. Now these tend to be all children with disabilities, but then children without disabilities can be coaches, can cheer the players on. In fact, at one school, uh, I understand that they had, um, imagine closing down the whole school and having all 500 children fill up a sports hall and watch these two teams of children with disabilities play basketball against each other. There were cheerleaders, they were cheering, there was band playing. It was just a, a really magical time for these athletes. So that's something that's happening in Virginia. And by the way, these are all things that I think you can replicate in your countries. California has something that, that they've done that I think is just really, really unique and really great. So uh, Peter Strauss out in Los Angeles realized that there was a couple of situations that, that needed remedy. One was that there's a lot of children who were at risk for failing out of school. These are children from poverty, children from single family homes, um, uh, children who are, are prone to uh, joining gangs in inner city Los Angeles. There's also, he understood, a group of children with disabilities who were not getting to participate in sport. So he said, why don't we mix these two groups together? Let's have children who are at risk serve as kind of partners to children with disabilities in sports. And you see on the bottom here, things like basketball, soccer, flag football became popular sports. The, the children got uniforms, they traveled and competed against each other. Um, and and the, the marvelous thing was, as they done, did some research, is that children who were at risk, who were much higher rate of dropping out of school, stayed in school and oftentimes went on to secondary or to, to, um, to university afterwards. So it's a wonderful marriage of these two populations, this at-risk population, children with disabilities, it's now spread across California and into Hawaii and some other um, states as well. So that's a, a really cool program. All right, one more slide, please. This last program is out of Georgia, and this has been around since the, the mid-90s when Atlanta hosted the Paralympic Games. And the American Association of Adapted Sports was created right around that time. And what they did was they created sports programs for children with physical disabilities in and around Georgia. And again, like many programs, this has grown into Florida and into Kentucky and into Alabama, surrounding states. But what they've done is they have wheelchair basketball leagues, uh, wheelchair team handball leagues, wheelchair football leagues, track and field events. And in many cases, um, there are not enough children at any one school who use wheelchairs, so they blend together multiple school districts to form teams. And another kind of a cool thing is they allow children without disabilities to participate. They just have to participate in wheelchairs. So again, I just want to highlight four programs across the U.S., all founded by individuals, to be honest with you, who said, you know, there's a need to uh, allow children with disabilities to get more opportunities to participate in sport. It would be great if we can do this in a school setting and an inclusive setting. And these are just some of the great examples. So thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to answer questions at the very end. 
Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Block. And again, I, I want to reiterate to your point that these were all started by individuals that didn't come from a massive you know, organizations, associations, conglomerates. It was individuals that made decisions that they wanted to start programs. I think a really important point. Thank you for your kind and wise words to start. Okay, we're going to hop back in that plane. We're going to fly all the way across to the Middle East now to Dr. Omar Hindawi from Hashemite University in the Middle East in Jordan. Dr. Hindawi, over to you. Thank you, Dr. David. First of all, it's my great pleasure to be with all of you on this webinar to present my new program. Uh, dear esteemed colleagues, let me start my speech with a value that I believe in. That is our lives, whether short or long, are not evaluated by the number of years we live. They are evaluated by how much knowledge and experience we share and their impact on our community. So I did this my new global website and application for those with disability titled Empowerment and Sport Rehabilitation for Persons with Disability. It's adapted exercises, website and application. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this application talking about 120 classes, training classes in six languages. Just you need to explore the classes, to click on the explore classes, and you will go to this. Uh, you can select any language you need. If you go to the website, you will see this uh, home page, and you can start all the classes in six languages. Next slide, please. Uh, Every one of us have motivation. And my motivation to create this application, actually two motivations. The first one, societal responsibility towards persons with disability. And the second motivation, contribution to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Now we have 17 goals. I focused on three of them. Third goal, which is good health and well-being for persons with disability. Goal number 10, reduce inequalities, and seven, number 17, partnerships for the goals. Next slide, please. Now, about my uh, application and website, adapted exercises. We have video-based classes produced and designed training sessions in the form of applied training education films. Each class contains details, the description of exercises, the benefit of these exercises, and the performance method of all these exercises. Now we have 20 classes for seven different abilities, the disabilities, motor disability, included cerebral palsy, amputations, polio, spinal cord injuries, visual disability, hearing disability, intellectual disability, learning disability, attention deficit hyperactivity disorders, spectrum autism disorders. Each class, approximately 20 minutes, talking about training and how we can do exercises for persons with disability. I did this program in six languages, the six United Nations languages, which is Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. All these classes are accessible uh, in computers, mobile phones, and tablets. Next slide, please. Now, this is an example about the uh, motor disability promo for nine classes. It's around 20 seconds. Can you turn the video, please? For those with physical disabilities, such as amputee, paralysis, and cerebral palsy, this program includes nine sessions consisted of aerobics, aqua aerobics, warm-up, stretching, and strength exercise using machines and special equipment. Next slide, please. Now, this is another example about learning disability class 
This is the promo of learning disability, uh, learning disabilities. Please turn it on. Это группа мероприятий, предназначена для людей с ограниченными возможностями обучения. Он включает в себе один сеанс, который объясняет тренировки фристайла, который был разработан исключительно для них. As you can see, next slide, please. As you can see, this is in different languages, and I use many promos to show you that we use six languages. The last one in French language. Une catégorie d'exercice est conçue pour les personnes ayant une déficience motrice suite à une amputation, une paralysie cérébrale. Et des liaisons cérébrales. Elle comprend neuf séances, incluant des exercices aérobiques, aéronautiques, ainsi que des exercices d'entraînement, de renforcement et de physique avec et sans outils. L'exercice, l'entraînement, le renforcement et les exercices physiques. Une slide, please. Next slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have 20 promos for each uh, category of disability. I try to do uh, those videos in six languages, as you, as you said. So the target of this application for all categories of persons with disability and their families, organizations, institutions interested in the disability field in the world for the students of uh, sport, and the physical uh, education and sports science, special education, allied medical science students for sports sector, uh, such as committees, federations, sports club, the special institutions who are interested in uh, disability. Also for coaches, for uh, trainers and uh, supervi uh, supervisors working in the field of sport and physical activity of persons with disability. The last uh, slide, please. As you see, this is the website of the application. You can download it and you can go to the website. You see everything on it in uh, six languages, 120 classes. Uh, I hope that I give you something new. Uh, thank you so much and thanks for listening. Thank you. You are welcome, Omar. That was fantastic. I very much. Thank you. Uh, enjoyed reviewing your website, and I would certainly encourage people that are listening today to go Thank you. check it out. Now, we're going to hop back in our plane. We're going to leave the Middle East. Now we're going to fly all the way to New Zealand, um, where Bridget Meyer is going to be showing a video, and she works with the Hallberg Foundation. She lives and works in Dunedin in the South Island of New Zealand. And then we're actually going to mix things up a little bit, Eli. So I'm just giving you a little bit of a heads up. We're actually going to have Cindy present after Bridget because Cindy needs to step away. So we're going to move that around, but we'll just go up slides and then we'll come back. So I'm just giving you a little bit of a heads up. And number two, Eli, I've noticed in the, in the chat function, a number of people have asked about getting a copy of the slides. Is there a way for us to share the slides with all those who are attending the session today? Yes, of course. Um, I think we had, did we have Quok um, uh, next or? So we, so in the order that we have, we have Bridget's video, and then what I'm going to suggest we do is then have Cindy do her slides after the video from Bridget. So it'll give, give us a second to, to do that. Okay. Um, that's okay. I'm just going to go ahead to... Uh... So Bridget's, Bridget's was a video. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you got that? And then we'll go to Cindy. Yeah, let me go back into this deck here to where we were. And I'll just switch over to Bridget. Yep. Thank you very much, Eli. Give me one second. Here we go. There we go. Okay. All right. So we're now down in beautiful yeah. New Zealand. Bring oh, geez, here we go. Yeah, we have a, a nice presentation from uh, Bridget. So it's about five minutes. Uh, 
As a brief introduction, I've been working within the field of APA for the past 25 years, working towards creating environments where people of all levels of ability can participate in sport and recreation opportunities of their choice. I have a keen interest in APA within recreation and APA within education curriculum. My presentation today is going to demonstrate how using APA within the school environment can build towards creating a whole of school approach to inclusion, which in turn contributes to the Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities, specifically Article 24 of Education and Article 30, which focuses on the participation of cultural life, recreation, sport and leisure. My presentation is going to give an overview of four key areas. As many of us are aware, schools are complex places and often need stealth-like navigation precision to introduce something new into the daily rhythm of a well-oiled curriculum. Getting the right team on board for this project at the outset with a clear vision of what we were looking to achieve was important. If this concept worked, it would be something the school would see value in and would invest in in the future. In turn, would lay the platform for the whole all approach to inclusion. Using adapted physical activity as our vehicle and all of the nuances that go with playing sport would help to bring this program to life. The concept of the Growing Leaders Program came about through a discussion with the head of department at the Braithwaite Centre. The Braithwaite Centre is a supportive classroom for students who are considered as having high and complex support needs. It had been noted by the HOD that the Braithwaite Centre students would often sit and watch their college peers go about their gym classes with little interaction or invitation to join. The million dollar question was how do we change this? With this information at the forefront of mind, we knew we wanted to ignite a spark for all of the students involved and lock in a passion for adaptive physical activity, regardless of whether they were there as part of the growing leaders cohort or as a student from the Braithwaite Centre. The first week we spent with just the student leaders, leader group. We discussed what they, what they could expect from the program and what the program expected from them. We talked in depth about the adaptations of various sports we would look to use, but more importantly, we talked about setting the scene. One area we focused on was understanding the importance of routine, familiarity and consistency. With this in, with this in mind, we made sure every session was structured in exactly the same way. The student leaders would greet everyone at the main door and they would all into the gym space together. Team bibs would be given out and then a quick warm-up drill would be carried out followed by a skill set and then a 15-minute game. The session would conclude with a team huddle and a cheer for the other team and finally the shaking of hands. By week three, this routine was embedded with the various students from the Braithwaite Centre taking the lead during particular moments. A comment from the HOD was that it was at these subtle moments of engagement that gave her the most pleasure. The model that we used for this program was the cooperative learning model. As stated by Farouk and Azim in their paper, Nurturing Inclusive Education Through Cooperative Learning as a Pedagogical Approach at Primary School Level 2018, when a student learns from their peers, they will start to feel a sense of belongingness, responsibility and satisfaction. Farouk et al also goes on to state that cooperative learning strategies provide support for inclusive practice and synchronizes both academic and social school development. Through this program, we were able to witness the sense of belonging, responsibility and satisfaction come to life in all of the students who participated. We looked to gather some qualitative qualitative insights from the students that supported this program and asked them four questions two weeks after the program finished. For this particular presentation, I've looked close, more closely at questions two and four. And these are some of the quotes from the students. So those are focused on question two. And these are quotes focused on question four. In conclusion, to ensure the convention is honoured, we do at times need to be creative in how we bring various cohorts of people together. Structure support and a positive attitude, we can do some wonderful things. To quote Kurt Hahn, the founder of the Outward Bound Movement, 
There are three ways of trying to win the young. There is persuasion, there is compulsion, and there is attraction. You can preach at them. That is a hook without a worm. You can say you must volunteer. That will often not work. Or you can tell them you are needed. That appeal hardly ever fails. To continue to build the legacy of the convention for the future, all of the young people need it. Thank you. Thank you so much to Bridget for her presentation from Dunedin, New Zealand. Now we're gonna, we're gonna change things up. We're gonna fly a little bit north from there to Professor Cindy Sit, who's in Hong Kong and will be hosting uh, the Asian Society for Adaptive Physical Education and Exercise Conference in 2022. Dr. Sit, can you hear us okay? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. Wonderful, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Cindy. I'm currently the Vice President of AFAPA and the President of the Asian Society for Adapted Physical Education and Exercise. I'm very honored to have this opportunity to share my work with all of you here. Next slide, please. Physical inactivity becomes a serious global health problem. There are global initiatives that promote physical activity in children including those with disabilities. For example, Hong Kong joined the Active Healthy Kids Global Alliance in 2016. Last year, we produced the report card for children and youth with special educational needs. Based on the global health recommendations, we found that less than 20% of Hong Kong children and youth with special educational needs met 16 minutes of moderate to rigorous physical activity daily. And so according to the benchmark and the great descriptors, we can only give F grade. And we also found that about 35% of them met the screen time guideline less than two hours per day. Next slide, please. I was very pleased to get funding from the Hong Kong Jockey Club Charity Trust in 2018. We developed a three-year project that targets a children with four disability types in special schools. The goal of our project is to empower children with disabilities to get active and healthy through APA. The objectives are to provide them with opportunities to participate in physical activity, facilitate their physical and psychological health, enhance APA knowledge and skills in PE teachers, and promote social inclusion between children with and without disabilities. Up to now, 24 special schools joined our project. So I got the update until yesterday. <laughs> Next slide, please. We used a multi-level intervention approach at school and family levels. At school level, we invite overseas AP professionals such as Martin Brock to work with us and the special schools and develop adaptive PE curriculum and guidelines. We also promote active PE and active break. For example, each participating school is given the PE solution system and a big screen. Teachers can monitor the physical activity level of students during PE class. Other than that, we introduce four sports or activities, aerobic dance, floor curling, go ball and city volleyball. They are considered as non-traditional activities in Hong Kong and have the potential to raise the interest of our students. Next slide, please. Over the past year, we have organized a series of training workshops and webinars. Some of them are supported and endorsed by different organizations and leaders, such as UNESCO, Chair Manager IT Cherry Catherine, Afarpa, such as David Martin, and Yukapa, such as Kwok. We have also developed training videos and online training courses such as aerobic dance. At family level, we have prepared training videos and some loose equipment to each participating family. Up to now, this project is still ongoing. Our ultimate goal is to develop an effective and sustainable AP model that makes children with disabilities active and healthy in the long term. Next slide, please. So this is the end of my short presentation. Thank you very much for listening.
Thank you. You're most welcome, Dr. Sitton. Thank you very, very much for joining us, which I think is still, I, know, I can never remember what time it is where everybody else is, um, but I very much appreciate you joining us this morning for you. So Eli, we're now gonna go back in our slides and we're gonna to return to Kwok. So we're gonna fly across Asia from Hong Kong and we're gonna land in Finland where Dr. Kwok Ning is with us right now. And Kwok is actually affiliated with two universities. That's just how smart he is. So he's with the University of Eastern Finland and also the University of Limerick in Ireland. Kwok, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. So thank you very much. Um, um, thank you, David, for the invite and, and Eli as well. This, I'm very honored to be here to, to share some of this work. Um, as, uh, as David mentioned, I'm um, affiliated to University of Eastern Finland and University of Limerick. But I'm going to be talking a little bit about what we've done in Finland um, under a project that uh, was funded by the Ministry of Education and uh, Culture, as well as it was coordinated by the University of Uvascula and uh, Likes uh, Research Centre. Um, so this project is about including children with disabilities into national physical activity monitoring systems. Uh, so next slide, please. So I'd like you to just look at these numbers and then look at this equation and just try and figure out how to make sense of this equation. 30.5 plus 31.2. So just take a bit of time and figure out what am I trying to get at here? So as you can tell, I'm not really Finnish, but what you can see is that the Finnish language is that it's Tutka. And what Tutka means, sorry, Eli, yeah, thanks. It uh, means that we've got the two conventions here, two articles of the convention that we've combined together to bring this project um, called Tutka. And the first one is about the uh, opportunity to participate equally in recreation, leisure and sport. And the second one is the data collected um, and shall be disaggregated to help implement state party obligations. And this is the key thing here for this. So next slide, please. So in Finland, um, oh sorry, and, and so it, it's to go with the, um, the sustainable development goals of not leaving any, leave no one behind, as well as with the physical activity guidelines of every move counts. With the target being at 2030 to reduce physical inactivity by 15%, the new guidelines are that, um, sorry, move forwards, please. Um, yeah, um, the WHO recommends at least an average of 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous physical activity for, ch um, for children aged five to 17. And that also includes children with disabilities. So how do we measure this and how do we get to this? And um, one of the settings is in the school, as schools play an important role to promote physical activity and health behaviors of children and adolescents. So next slide, please. So in Finland, there's quite a long tradition of collecting national data um, uh, of adolescent health um, at school at school age and for example the health behavior in school age children that started in 1983 uh, has become quite a large international study uh, consisting of over 50 countries in 2014 there was a an offshoot from that study which focused on physical activity specifically on 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 physical activity and that was called the FSPA and two years later Finland finally ratified the Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And so with that, uh, the work that, that I worked on was um, to produce a, an adapted survey for a special education setting, and that's what's called the Tutka. And we used the Washington Group on Disability Statistics with the Child Function Module as um, a marker for, um, for disabilities. And in addition to that, there was the combined um, um, national fitness function battery test called the MOVE. Uh, you, you might read it as MOVE, but uh, it's pronounced as MOVE. And um, what is quite interesting, they've been running that um, national database for at least five years, if not 10 years. And only 1% of that population of that database includes children with uh, special educational settings. So there needed to be some adaptations to this. Um, so then teachers can, can make these national functional tests, fitness tests, and um, put them into the database. So I'm going to show you some um, examples in the next slide, please. So the first example is from the Washington Group question, which is a, a self-report survey of functional difficulties. And, um, and so 
So here you see an example of three different surveys asking the same question depending on the different types of needs of the individuals, with the L being a large survey, M being a medium, which has um, easy to read language, and S being this, the simplest version, with, um, which has, is the simplest way of asking. Let's just go back one slide, please. Oh no, so let's just go forward, one, forward skip the next slides. Forward please, and next one go forward again. Just again, apologies. No problem. Okay, I'll just leave the mouse at the moment. So here's a demonstration of what is the functional test on the left hand side um, of the national standard that um, has been put into place for the database. You see a, ball, a boy is throwing a ball to a target and then it bounces and picking it up. And here's the adaptation, the one on the right hand side. In this case, is a person in a wheelchair. The distance is a little bit closer and the ball bounces twice. And so what we get the opportunity here is, is we can see uh, the fitness levels um, and the functional fitness levels of, um, of all the children um, possible once the teachers know how to um, simulate uh, and to instruct these functional tests. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so just in short, in summary, um, I'd like to say that the digital insights from data on children with disabilities can be used to understand and act on a role for social development and participation in recreation and sports. Um, I really hope that you might be able to use some of the examples that we did here. I'd also like to invite you to uh, look at the uh, University of Uvascular and the ISAPA site to look into attending the, the forthcoming international symposium that is being hosted in Finland. Uh, you might see pictures like these then. Otherwise, thank you very much and kiitos. Thank you very much, Kwok. I very much enjoyed your presentation. So now we're gonna hop, hop back on our plane. We're gonna fly from the northern climates of Finland. We're gonna fly directly south to Nigeria where we have Dr. Ogu Oki Charles from Nandi Azikawi University in Nigeria. Oki, can you hear me okay? Okay. Yes, I'm hearing you. Thank you, David. Um, You're welcome. I'm going to discuss on promoting inclusive environments through adapted physical activity. My name is uh, Ogo Feta at Nanda Azikawi University. Next slide. Please, next slide. Um, uh, this very slide we, you know, present the structure of my presentation. I will discuss APA in inclusive environment, how APA creates inclusive environment, and range of adapted physical activity environments as for inclusion spectrum, impact and outcomes of APA, global relevance concern and conclusion. Please, next slide. Now, how APA helps to create inclusive environment? It is necessary to in, emphasize the work of people rather than differences between people. This will encourage uh, a portrayal of people with disabilities in a positive fashion. Activities uh, must be designed for all because it makes it necessary to attribute equal importance to inclusion rather than segregated structure glorifying discrimination. We should also emphasize the culture of physical activity by creating the concept of physical literacy, creating environment of opportunities for integration and allowing individuals with physical disabilities equal opportunities to gain the same benefits or results from participating in physical activity. There is also need to integrate adapted sports with a physical education program. For example, allowing mentally retarded persons into track team, allowing wheelchair persons to participate in all runners marathon, including those without disability. Everybody's persons and those that use wheelchair may also compete in wheelchair tennis, and the same thing applies to uh, wheelchair basketball. We should also 
encourage parallel teaching and open inclusive activity. Next slide, please. Now, this slide brings into focus a uh, range of adapted physical activity environment across inclusive spectrum. Now, most students with disabilities can safely and successfully participate in general physical education with or without support. However, some children benefit from adapted physical education content. Content in adapted physical education to mirror the general physical education curriculum to the greatest extent possible. Physical activity provides all people, including those with disabilities, with many physical, mental, and social benefits. Participation in general physical education class at school is very, very important for students with disabilities, not only to reap physical benefits, but also to help build an identity, confidence, friendship, and to feel success. Next slide, please. Now, I'm going to discuss the impact and outcomes of adapted physical activity in this uh, slide. There are general perceptions that regular participation in sports and uh, physical activity is considered as Fundamental elements of a healthy lifestyle. What is organization supply that also support this uh, general opinion? Studies based on persons with disabilities, participating in adapted sports, recreation, and leisure, have revealed that they benefit from quality of life. There's also increased in self efficacy through support modeling performance, offering encouragement by providing transportation to physical activity programming. Greater confidence towards other body and the attraction, positive opinion with respect to ability. Physical education activity can serve as an adjunct to cancerous lifestyle diseases. For example, heart disease, diabetes, and certain forms of cancer. Secondary health conditions such as depression pain will be alleviated through participation in physical activity. It can also improve all levels of functioning and negative effects of sedentary lifestyle can be reversed through regular physical activity. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to talk about the global relevance on adapted physical activity. The guiding principles of inclusion require approaches to improve participation in accordance with the fundamental rights of to participate in physical activity and sports, as proclaimed in the UNESCO's International Charter of Physical Education and Sports. This is central importance as Article 30, Section 5 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which cover the spectrum of opportunities for people with disabilities. The idea that countries to ensure an inclusive education system at all levels is also the central objective of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Since Salamanca in 1994, UNESCO and the uh, Special Needs Education 2008. The UN have also recognized and advocated and supported the important contributions of sports to development and peace. Sports can encourage inclusion and equal participation of people with disabilities. Next slide, please. Now, constraints. I took my time out to include constraints to promoting inclusive physical. Uh, env uh, inclusive environment uh, using adapted physical activity because of our situation uh, coming from a developing country. Now, lack of awareness on the path of persons without disabilities as to how to engage individuals with disabilities effectively in inclusive sports settings 
There is also lack of opportunities and program on APA for training and the competition in Nigeria and other developing countries. Too few accessible facilities due to physical barriers. There is also limited information and adapted fiscal activity resources, especially in developing countries. With our strength of state parties in Africa to implement United Conventions on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, especially UNESCO's International Charter addressing rights-based approach to the inclusion and integration of disabled persons in sports and the quality physical education. Next slide, please. I will end my presentation by concluding and also suggesting that world body like United Nations should ensure full implementation of resolutions of conventions on rights of people with disabilities by state parties, particularly where there is no compliance, if it is possible. They should also encourage developing nations with financial and training fiscal education efforts. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Charles. Very much appreciated your presentation. We're now going to hop back on a plane from the west coast of Africa. We're going to fly now to back to the Middle East, to Turkey, where Dr. Diala Oser from Istanbul Kent University, beautiful Istanbul. I say that actually, I've never been to Istanbul, so I don't know, but I've, I've heard it's lovely. So Dr. Oser, over to you. And then we're going to finish with Dr. Van Munster down in Brazil, and then that will end our formal presentations. And we likely won't have time for a lot of questions. Um, so I would strongly encourage you to either put your questions in the Q&A or in the chat function, and we'll try and get to them as our final presentations are being made. Dr. Ozer, over to you. Thank you. Dear colleagues, it's an honor to meet you in this webinar. So thank you for this opportunity. The title of my presentation is The Effects of Online Support Services on Quality of Life for Individuals with Intellectual Disabilities and Their Mothers During Pandemic. I will give some information about this project. Uh, next, please. Next slide. Yes, thank you. COVID-19 has deeply affected the lifestyle of each person individually and has led to change in daily routines and lifestyle since 11 March 2020, when the first case was seen in our country. One of the groups affected by this situation was individuals with special needs and their families. With the intrusion of COVID-19 into our lives, individuals with special needs lost their already very limited social environment and got isolated into their homes, eating more meals, watching TV, and sitting down during the process of lockdown started to threaten their psychological health as well as their physical health. Next, please. Within the family, uh, it is possible to say that mothers are more affected by this project, by this uh, process. Other children continuing their education from home and fathers working from home increase the workload of mothers at home. When the needs of children with special needs are added to this workload, mothers have no time for themselves. Next, please. Based on this, a project was carried out. Uh, this is not a, my presentation, Ellie, I think. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. No, I think uh, before then, okay, I will, okay, I will continue, no. Uh, based on this project uh, was carried out to examine the effects of online support services on the quality of life and physical activities of individuals 
with ID and their mothers during pandemic. Yeah, next please. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Thank you, next slide. That's, that's it, okay. Experimental method was used in the research. Uh, 110 individuals with ID between the ages of 25 and 50, and their mothers voluntarily participated in the study. 50 individuals with ID and their mothers were included in the experimental group, 60 in the control group. This scale, uh, as you see, and forms were applied in order to collect data on quality of life and physical activity level of the participants. Next, please. Online support training model consists of two separate programs for individuals with ID and their mothers. The program for individuals with ID includes two parts, physical activity and rhythm and music programs. Next, please. Okay, and uh, next please. Yes, uh, this picture is from Rhythm and Music program. And the other slide please, next please. Next slide, yeah. Uh, this picture from uh, Online Physical Activity program. Thank you. And next slide please. Uh, for the program for mothers, in these programs run by a psychologist, mothers were provided with psychological counseling and guidance. This program consists of 80-minute sessions once a week. Next, please. We cannot, unfortunately, we cannot present scientific results as we are in the process of collecting post-test data still. However, the feedback we receive from the mothers gives important clues that the support education programs are working. Next, please. Yeah, their message to us, we wish the project would never end. So, what will happen after the project is over? The project will continue with the support of Istanbul Kent University and Unimpeded Education Foundation until individuals with ID and their mothers return to their social lives. Uh, I hope this project disseminate in all over the world and the other uh, slide, next please. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Thank Oster. You. That was a wonderful presentation. And again, I've loved, I've loved the variety of subjects that we've been addressing, mothers, families, children, school systems, uh, community recreation, it's been fantastic. Our final presentation, so we're going to hop right back in that plane. We're going to head down now from the Middle East to South America, and where our final presentation is from Dr. May Van Munster from the UN and avert <laughs> I'll try to say it properly, the University Federal de Sao Carlo in Brazil. How's that? Dr. Van Munster, over to you. Thank you, David and Eli. I'm delighted to be celebrating the International Day of Persons of Disabilities with you. I'll just describe myself. I'm a 51-year-old woman with long reddish hair, pale skin with freckles and blue eyes. My sign in Brazilian Sign Language is the letter M, the initial of my name, in a circle movement in front of the cheek. Next slide, please. I've been engaged with adapted physical activity and sports in Brazil for the past 30 years and have the best job in the world. 
As a professor in the Department of Physical Education, I'm responsible for professional training of future physical education teachers. My role is to prepare leaders to teach adapted physical activity and sports for people with disabilities. Along with undergrad courses, we offer a service program designed to deliver adapted physical activity for people with disabilities, providing them unique motor experiences. The interaction with this audience also provides a significant hands-on experience for the academics during their professional training process. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. One of my favorite activities in our program is the swimming for babies with cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, and other peculiar conditions. Through playful activities and music, perceptual motor stimuli are provided so that the babies can overcome possible initial developmental delays and reach their maximum potential since their very early stages. Next, please. Parents are important partners during this process. They receive guidance to continue this stimuli during bathing and other routine situations at home. It is important to ensure quality of life for parents and family members who usually dedicate a large portion of their time to take care of their children. While young children practice swimming with their instructors, a moment of self-care and relaxation is reserved for the parents through aquatics activities. Next, please. Our challenge is to awaken pleasure and interest in physical and sports activities, encouraging people with disabilities to adopt an active lifestyle at all stages of their lives. Evolution, interests, and outcomes of people with disabilities are always monitored. However, goals and personal goals during sports practice are established by themselves. Some are seeking exercise, some are just looking for opportunities of interaction and social participation, while others enjoy exploring their physical limits and are encouraged to participate in competitions. Next slide, please. The greatest aspect about swimming is that it is a very democratic physical activity. Even a person with severe injuries may experience and find some independence in the liquid environment. But physical education professionals are responsible for expanding the opportunities for exploring body experiences and introducing the most diverse possibilities of physical and sports activities to this audience. Next slide, please. Sometimes, these educational processes may become ideal scenarios for the development of research. The evolution of people with disabilities across the activities is constantly evaluated by specific protocols and scientific methods of investigation under multiple aspects. Next, please. Next slide, please. And who would say that a tropical country like Brazil would have a team of Nordic skiing? Even without snow, we have found a way of teaching the basic techniques to roller ski and mountain boards. The athletes make a transition from the asphalt to the snow and reach unexpected results. Next, please. Next slide, please. Two Brazilian athletes got the podium at the Vokati World Cup in Finland last year, Quok. <laughs> Christian Ribeira is currently the fourth athlete in the Paranordic Ski World Ranking. And we are very proud of our athletes and their results. But the outcomes of adapted physical activities are far beyond medals. We celebrate every little accomplishment. The first time a kid swings without support, when a recent amputee scores his first goal in a wheelchair handball game, this is what moves a physical educator. Next slide, please. 
As a remarkable Brazilian educator used to say, education doesn't change the world. Education changes people. People change the world. And how challenging and delightful is to work with people, especially through adapted physical activity. Obrigada. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Van Munster. I, I love how I had to see a presentation from a woman in Brazil about cross-country skiing uh, on, on snow. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, I very much enjoyed the variety of presentations. I, I hope for those of you that are listening that there are a number of takeaways that are, that are specific, that are tangible, that are practical, uh, that can cross boundaries as it relates to disability, culture, and context. I also want to express my sincere thanks to those of you for staying around. I, I am cognizant and respectful that we've gone a few minutes over time, and I certainly don't like keeping people beyond what we've asked them to originally. So I am respectfully saying thank you uh, for those of you who have remained with us throughout this time. I want to take this opportunity to thank, first of all, Eli, uh, for helping me put this together. Eli, I very much enjoy working with you. You're a very good friend, uh, and I very much appreciate all that you do. Um, with me and for me. So I'm grateful for our friendship. Um, I apologize for the rapid mouse a couple times. And so thank you for all bearing with me on that. <laughs> um, please express my sincere thanks to Daniela uh, Bass for her video presentation at the start. Catherine, thank you for joining us again. Thank you for your continued leadership and engagement uh, with IFAPA in the work that you do. You're a tremendous mentor uh, to me personally and professionally. And I, I very much appreciate that. To our eight speakers who are all members of, of IFAPA and uh, in most respects are the regional representatives for the different uh, regions of the world. It was, uh, it was a menagerie of approaches and ideas and just ways of looking at adaptive physical activity and how it applies in a global context and how it relates to the 17 SDGs and in particular on this day, International Day of celebrating persons with disabilities and focusing on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, I can think of no better way uh, to celebrate ideas of inclusion through adaptive physical activity. So with that, again, I'm cognizant of the time. I'm sorry that we don't have an opportunity uh, for more of an engagement with questions and answers. I am prone to do that. I always underestimate you know, how long people will talk, and I do apologize for that. Um, certainly happy to engage offline with people and to connect them with the variety of speakers that we had. So please reach out to Eli or myself if you wish to do that. With that, I'll say good night. Thank you for all the material and, and keep the community connected. And, and thank you all so much. Yeah, happy International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And thank you again.